forward here. Okay, there we go. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first Kimberlite, uh, Vancouver Kimberlite Cluster Seminar of 2022. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, first, I'm just gonna briefly introduce myself. So my name is Amy Maley and I'm a master's student at UBC and I'm studying under Professor Maya Kopalova. Um, I've taken over from Catherine Mondoni as the VKC host for this year. Um, Catherine is moving on after successfully defending her master's thesis. So I am originally from Calgary and I completed my undergrad degree there at the U of C. And I worked in the oil and gas industry for five years after finishing my bachelor's degree. And I spent the majority of my time working in exploration and looking at Brazilian pre-salt um, lacustrine carbonates. So I'm very excited to move into the igneous and metamorphic world um, and learn more through my master's project, which is focusing on um, kimberlite geochemistry and reactions with crustal xenoliths. So I also have with me here virtually uh, Maya Kobolova, who is our convener. Um, she's back um, after her sabbatical and she will be resuming that role. And she is also today's speaker. So the BKC is a series of seminars um, for diamond geology and related topics. And its goal is to bring both academics and industry professionals together. Um, I would like to acknowledge SRK Consulting for being a long-standing BKC sponsor. Um, and just a few housekeeping items. I know we are all pretty well versed on Zoom at this point, but if you could keep your microphones and cameras off during the presentation, that will just help with the quality of streaming. And the presentation will be about 50 minutes long. Um, so you can please keep your questions for the end, at which point I will facilitate a question and answer period. Um, and then after that q and I will stop recording and we'll move on to a virtual social hour and we can all chat a little bit more informally. So now I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Maya Kopalova who is a professor at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver. Um, most of you probably know Maya quite well, um, but I'm gonna do just a brief introduction before she gets started on her talk. Maya completed her MSc at- oh, my fucking computer, I can't get the audio. <laughs> uh, Maya completed her MSc at Lomonosov Moscow State University before moving on to complete her PhD at the Schmidt Institute of Physics of Earth in Moscow. She then went on to complete a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Cape Town. Maya is an accomplished researcher and has held visiting researcher positions at numerous universities, including Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia, Hebrew University in Israel, and Vernadsky Institute of Geochemistry and Analytical Chemistry in Russia. She was the recipient of an NSERC University Faculty Award from 2000 to 2006 and a Royal Society Visiting Researcher Grant in Durham, UK in 2007. Maya has been working as a professor at UBC since 2013, where she, con where she continues to pursue her research in kimberlite petrology and volcanology, characterization of diamonds and their mineral inclusions, as well as mantle xenolith petrology. And now I will hand things over to you, Maya, to get started on your presentation. So I will stop sharing my screen here. Thank you, Thank you Amy. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. I'm happy to share with you the results we acquired over the last three years of fields in the Kola Magmatic Province. Uh, from the list of co-authors, you see that we uh, have quite a large team of geologists and we all got together because we uh, were awarded a grant by the Russian Science Foundation to study relationship between kimberlites, carbonatites, and uh, ultramafic lamprophies. 
in Arkhangelsk and Kola Magmatic Provinces. And we collected interesting material that I would like to share with you today. And in the title of my presentation, uh, several of the uh, terms might need special introduction for this audience. And I'll start with the introduction to Lamprophias. Uh, Lamprophia, unlike some other volcanic rocks, cannot be distinguished and classified based on the common test diagram total alkalines against silica, where we distinguish between andesites and basalts, for example. Uh, for, um, for a rock to be classified as lamprophy, a rock must be present in dikes, must have a certain texture and certain mineralogy. And initially, the lamprophies uh, were um, defined as rocks with uh, shiny uh, phenocrysts, lamp-like phenocrysts, like amphiboles and biotites. And in the most recent um, Bible for Ignis Petrology, Lemaitre, uh, uh, lamprophies were defined as dike rocks, porphyritic and a cellar with texture with exclusively mafic phenocrysts, and they can be further classified into ultra mafic lamprophies and alkaline lamprophies and calc alkaline lamprophies. And as you see from my field photographs, our lamprophies indeed occur in dikes, indeed might have amphibole phenocrysts, and indeed they plot together with picrites, with basanites, so they cannot be distinguished from these rocks on the basis of bulk composition. And lamprophies are very diverse. And altermafic lamprophies might look just like kimberlites. Uh, the only difference, slightly different texture and slightly different model abundances of minerals, as you see in these photographs from uh, West Greenland and altermafic lamprophies. And as the alkalinity of the rock increases, the amount of olivine and carbonate drops. And instead, in uh, alkaline lamprophies, we see more biotite and phlogopite, more clinoparoxine, more melilite, and uh, perhaps potassium feldspar and analcine. And we produce such uh, exotic varieties and exotic names of rocks like monchikids, dumpternites, and sunites. And many of us know of lamprophies as related rocks, related to kimberlites. And if we look at that classic diagram by Barbara, we uh, would um, classify our lamprophies as melnoites on this diagram. And um, what I would like you to note from on this diagram is, first of all, we have a complete petrographic and mineralogical overlap with kimberlites here. Also that these lamprophies are more common than kimberlites and they have no chance to be uh, economic with respect to diamond. The second thing that requires introduction in my title is the Kola Alkaline Carbonatitic Province. And this is the area of um, alkaline magmatism Devonian in age with ages mostly around 380, 370 million years. And this area is in Northern Europe, in Russia and in Finland. And 70% of the volume of these alkaline rocks exist in only two uh, nephilim uh, cyanide complexes here. But we also see a lot of smaller uh, central type intrusions of alkaline rocks with carbonatites, lamprophias. And if we zoom out and look at that map to the right, uh, we see that um, 
even before their main pulse of uh, Devonian magmatism here, alkaline magmatism was quite common in the surrounding areas, and we have lots of Proterozoic alkaline intrusions around here as well. Uh, here is an example of a uh, very commonly uh, occurring uh, central type of massif with atomic rocks and carbonatitic rocks, uh, Kavdor massif map. And I would like you to appreciate, first of all, the multi-phase nature of that massif and also the huge diversity of different rock types, starting from olivinites, going into pyroxenites, melilitholites, alkaline ultramafic rocks, and the latest phases of intrusion would be uh, phosphorites or carbonatites. Also, I would like you to appreciate the huge area of finitization around that massif, which is the uh, alkaline alteration caused by uh, magmatic gases, uh, volatiles associated with carbonatites and alkaline rocks. And that uh, uh, particular massif has been mined in open pits for iron, for phosphorus, and also for phlogopite. And uh, next to the uh, Kola Alkaline province, to the southeast lies the Arkhangelsk Kimberlite province. The total area uh, of the province is approximately 50 by 100 kilometers. And here we see several clusters of Kimberlites and uh, the economic pipes would have uh, sizes of approximately one kilometer in diameter. Here we see different um, Kimberlites here, the plan views for these Kimberlites. And uh, also see that we have some alkaline rocks on the periphery of these Kimberlite province, rocks that are defined as alkaline picrites or alkaline basalts. And uh, if we look at the cross section of the bodies, we see that the crater faces are quite well developed. Uh, the majority of the volume is represented by pyroclastic kimberlites and some um, unusual uh, morphological um, uh, morphology of the body also exists, for example, seals in the Mela cluster. Uh, these kimberlites in place through Archean uh, granites and gneisses and also through 700 meters of uh, proterozoic sediments, um, sandstone, ergolites, and also covered by quaternary and um, carboniferous carbonate sediments up to 50 meters uh, of the cover is on top. And uh, based on the geology, we should expect the uh, Fort Alacorn type pyroclastic kimberlite comprising the pipes. Uh, so we should not expect a lot of uh, crustal zenith in these kimberlites. And in the past, these kimberlites uh, were not quite um, straightforwardly classified because there was some reports of melilite present in these kimberlites, but with new uh, investigations and studies, we know that they are typical group one kimberlites. And currently three pipes have been mined in open pit and open pit mining will continue for another four years. And the grades are quite good between one and 1 1.4 carats per ton. Well, so why we decided to study the uh, Kola alkaline province next to Arkhangelsk Kimberlites? because the associations of carbonatites and kimberlites or lamprophies and kimberlites are quite rare. 
what is common is the association of atrimorphic lamprophies with carbonatites. They occur very, very common, but it's not that common to find proximal and a coeval development of alkaline province and kimberlitic province. So we know of only a few examples in the world in Australia, in West Greenland, and only five years ago, we got accurate estimates of the ages of magmatism in Kola and in Arkhangelsk, and only then we realized that they are synchronous. And um, based on the uh, current paradigm for the origin of uh, kimberlites and carbonatites, we should not expect them to form together. If we uh, look at this map where carbonatites are shown in black dots, we see that most of carbonatites would be restricted to continental rifts. And we see this on that classic cartoon by Wiley, carbonatites, alkaline rocks forming in the thin, relatively hot lithosphere beneath rifts and kimberlites are away. And also based on the geochemical reservoirs, we should expect different sources for kimberlites and carbonatites. For kimberlites, we should expect asthenospheric sources plotting right in the middle of the strontium niodymium plot, whereas carbonatites and ultramafic lamprophies plot much more wider on that plot, coming from the depleted mantle and from the enriched mantle lithosphere. So the summary uh, can be envisioned like this. Kimberlites are uh, rooted in the convecting mantle beneath thick cratons, whereas carbonatites and atomic lamprophies are rooted in a thinner, hotter lithosphere uh, away from these thick cratons. So based on that, uh, of course, uh, it's interesting to study uh, this unique location and see perhaps the transition from alkaline to kimberlitic magmatism. And in order to reduce factors that can contribute to the melt diversity, uh, we uh, focused on this tightly geographically restricted area called Tierski Coast. This is where we see transition from central type massifs with uh, carbonatites and alkaline rocks through lamprophies and to the first kimberlite. This is Yermakovskaya 7 pipe, which is away from the rest of the kimberlite clusters uh, in Arkhangelsk. And I would like to share with you conclusions right in the beginning of my talk. So I will lead you um, to these conclusions. We will show that the metasomatized mantle is necessary to generate alkaline melts and that mantle can be seen uh, in place in kimberlites. And lamprophies and kimberlites may have absolutely identical melt sources. And um, we can identify several factors that uh, would uh, control the identity of the crystallizing melt on the surface. And an ascent rate could be one of those factors. And uh, I also finish by introducing a exotic trend at a highly radiogenic strontium uh, composition that can be controlled by finitization of the old crust. And I will argue that that trend can be a hallmark for the origin of the melt in large uh, alkaline or kimberlite province. So let's start the story. We um, had 
three fields and collected over 200 samples of dikes, lamprophilic carbonatitic dikes, in three areas of the Chersky coast, Kandaguba, Kandalaksha, and Turimis, and also in Yermakovskaya pipe uh, to the east. And we uh, studied thoroughly 85 samples um, for petrography, mineralogy, bulk rock chemistry, taste element chemistry, and isotopic composition. And we also modeled crystallization and assimilation, crustal assimilation for these um, compositions. And uh, you see uh, that in the field, our dikes ranged from uh, really thin, only 10 centimeters to uh, reaching one meter in, the, in width. And they showed us a range of colors, uh, brown for carbonatitic dikes, black for more silicate rich dikes, show a range uh, of texture from uh, lead to massive textures, from porphyritic to aphanitic. And in Kandalaksha, uh, we see a range of lamprophies uh, starting from atomorphic lamprophies ilicides to uh, phlogopite carbonatides and more alkaline monchikites. So ilicides are essentially olivine plus carbonate with a little bit of clinopyroxene and phlogopite. And interestingly, we see a complete transition from these ilicides to phlogopite carbonatides. And we also see magmatic garnet. Here is magmatic garnet. For monchikites, we see more clinopyroxene and biotite. And in a different area, the compositions of lamprophies are more alkaline rich. So we have uh, less olivine, more clinopyroxene. We have lots of a cell lie in rocks in field with analcim and carbonate and potassium feldspar. And we also see transitions to phonolite and nephilinite. And uh, we see lots of monchikites here as well. And for turimis, we see nephilinites, uh, uh, monchikites, and lots of rocks with melilite. And this melilite is never fresh. It's always replaced by um, intergrowth of secondary minerals and garnet quite typically replaces melilite. Here we have elnuites, turiites, which are melilitolites with uh, magmatic garnet and also carbonatites. And uh, Yermakovska 7 kimberlite uh, is a group one kimberlite, but quite rich in phlogopite, titanium and potassium rich in trace elements also show quite high um, oxygen and fugacity, doesn't have uh, primary spinel, have uh, magnetite, and does not have fresh olivine or fresh perovskite. If we plot uh, all these lamprophies uh, on the strontium niodymium plot, we uh, see quite a scatter of points. And here we marking different locations with different color and different rock types with different shapes of symbols. And we see that our points are ranging from depleted mantle protolith to uh, asthenospheric in the central point and to the enriched mantle or crustal uh, protolith. But we uh, see no correlation with the rock type or locality. And therefore, we wanted to untangle this um, cloud of rocks with a principal component analysis. So we used five different variables for this analysis, all um, isotopic ratios for lead, niodymium, and strontium. 
And based on these two factors, we finally saw separation of the uh, rocks into three clusters. And they can be easily observed on the niodemium strontium isotopic ratios. And I will use uh, these colors and these um, abbreviations for trend one, trend two, and trend three in the future when we discuss the origin of these three trends separately. Uh, what I also would like you to see is that our data plot on top of the literature data for the Kola alkaline province, all these gray spots on the background. And now let's uh, think about trend one. All these black points on the niodymium strontium isotopic plot, and you see that they line up uh, on this blue line called Kola carbonatitic line by analogy with the East African carbonatitic line. So this line has been identified almost 30 years ago and was thought to be a mixing line for uh, between two geochemical reservoirs, depleted mantle and enriched mantle. And um, we agree with this interpretation, but instead of um, thinking about theoretical reservoirs, we wanted to identify these reservoirs from xenolith brought to the surface in Arkhangelsk kimberlite. The grip pipe, one of the pipe in pipes in Arkhangelsk province is quite famous for having large fresh zinlith. And here are photographs of those grip uh, zinlith. So indeed, we see some depleted Herzburgites and they plot here. And we see some enriched lozolites and clinopyroxenites with phlogopite, and they plot in this uh, blue field um, marked the grip metasomatized mantle. Um, another thing I would like you to appreciate on this plot is how close is the uh, strontium niodemium composition of the grip kimberlite to this field for the grip metasomatized mantle. And that fact can be interpreted in two different ways. Uh, we can say that this kimberlite is derived from the enriched metasomatized mantle, or we can say perhaps that it was the other way around, that the proto-kimberlitic melt uh, was the metasomatic agent of enrichment and refertilization that affected that depleted mantle. Another thing I would like to, uh, you to see here is this very interesting sample where we see the transition from uh, depleted Herzburgite on one side to enriched um, lozolite with new metasomatic clinopyroxene on the other side. And that transition happens over a distance of only one centimeter. And in our mind, this is um, how we should expect to see the spatial relationship between the depleted reservoir and the enriched reservoir in the mantle. So we see the intimate coexistence of these two reservoirs on the scales of only millimeters or centimeters. And the factor in the enriched or depleted um, composition of isotopes can be just how proximal this sample is to the channel of the metasomatic agent penetration. And these channels must be lined up with uh, calcic minerals like garnet and clinopyroxene megacrysts, with titanium-rich minerals like ilmenite megacrysts, and uh, 
Sheet refertilized peridotites should not be far away from those channels, but depleted mantle would be further away from these penetrating metasomatic agents. And in our view, uh, the models that uh, separate by uh, depth or in distance, the uh, enriched mantle and the depleted mantle like this model by Foley is less realistic to what we see in our mantle samples. Now let's uh, think about the second trend, these uh, purple symbols. They show quite a variety of epsilon niodymium value at almost constant ratios of strontium. And if we plot these purple points on a large scale niodymium strontium plot, we see that these uh, points trend towards the uh, green points, and these are local uh, Proterozoic and Archean uh, lower crust. And maybe uh, the trend was produced by crust contamination, and this is totally feasible because we see um, small chips and zinglith of the country rocks in our dikes. In order to check if this crustal con contamination can be a viable hypothesis, we can look at difference in strontium niodymium ratio for different minerals in lamprophies. And luckily, uh, we uh, can have uh, different types of calcic minerals where we can make these types of analysis. We can look at early crystallizing perovskite and late crystallizing uh, magmatic calcic garnet. And we definitely see a shift in strontium and niodymium ratios as we crystallize, uh, as, we, as crystallization proceeds, meaning that the melt was an open system and um, assimilated something before crystallizing garnet. And uh, on the plot, if we model uh, contamination by the local crust and uh, drive as a result of this assimilation of the crust, the rock from initial perovskite analysis towards late garnet analysis, we see that we require 15 weight percent of contamination in order to uh, assimilate, in, in order to see the late crystallizing garnet with such strontium and niodymium ratios. But more elaborate analysis of the um, crustal assimilation can be done if we um, run a special program called AFC which stands for assimilation fractional crystallization. So this is the gold standard in Ignis petrology where we simultaneously uh, compute assimilation of the foreign material that causes then fractional crystallization and settling down of some crystals. And commonly lots of parameters can be involved in um, assumption for these AFC models, but luckily we don't need to assume the distribution coefficients for strontium and niodymium because we know them quite well, because we studied petrography of our rocks very well, so we know exactly what crystallizes and at what stage and from what type of lamprophies. So, uh, these are the results of our AFC modeling. So we are looking at the zoomed in space of this gray rectangle on the left. And here we're looking at two types of uh, models, green lines that start from perovskites in eilikites. So this is the most primitive types of melts. And we also uh, looked at crystallization of 
uh, monchicites and uh, magnesium melanephilinides. So they crystallize different type of assemblage and therefore the slope of these assimilation lines are different. But in both cases, we see that these assimilation lines go through these purple points. Therefore, we can say that these points um, are controlled by assimilation of the local crust, local uh, lower crust. Well, we're on to trend three. Uh, we have green points for trend three, and we see that they plot very strangely. First of all, they show the uh, positive correlation between epsilon niodymium and strontium, whereas commonly we have just the opposite, inverse correlation between these two parameters. Secondly, we see that these points plot in the forbidden space, if you wish, in that quadrant where nothing should plot. And if we look at the correlation between epsilon niodymium and the uh, content of niodymium, we also see a uh, positive correlation, uh, which is the evidence for the open system behavior. So what is this open system behavior? And um, I'll try to convince you that this is also crustal contamination, but contamination by a very specific type of crust, phenotized crust. So remember that halo of phenotization we saw around Cavdor massif. And um, so the same type of reaction we see happening in the field. So you see uh, undulating brown carbonatitic veinlet uh, creating the halo of pink color because we are making uh, these um, potassium feldspar as part of the new uh, phenotized assemblage. So in those nices, we see replacement of biotite and amphibole by this alkaline assemblage of potassium feldspar, edgerine, and alkaline amphibole. And this process of phenotization and the uh, changes in the strontium uh, ratio that accompany that process of phenotization has been modeled by Bayer for Kola alkaline province for this alkaline pluton called Sustav. And they were able to reproduce these extremely high strontium ratios for this pluton if they assumed that the pluton was um, contaminated by the phenot phenotized crust that stayed uh, with the high potassium and rubidium for at least 1,000 million years, so 1 billion years. So that's why the crust needs to be old in order to evolve, in order to have time to evolve to such high strontium ratios. And now I would like us to look at the literature data, uh, a red field for cola uh, basic dikes, a green field for Yakutian kimberlites. This is um, Botobinska kimberlite also in Yakutia. And you see they all plot in that forbidden quadrant and they all shifted to the high strontium ratios. And I think that what we're seeing here is the effect of um, emplacement of these melts through the previously phenotized old crust. And this is expected for these locations because they all come from large alkaline and kimberlitic province. And these provinces commonly experienced multiple episodes of magmatism. So uh, in Yakutia, for example, we have at least four different episodes of 
uh, kimberlite formation all in a tightly geographically restricted area. Uh, let's go to Kola. Here we also have Proterozoic alkaline magmatism and then Devonian alkaline magmatism. In North America, on the slave, we have Cambrian kimberlites up to Eocene kimberlites, uh, Jurassic kimberlites as well. In Superior, we have Proterozoic Kyle Lake kimberlite and right next to it, Victor kimberlite, Jurassic kimberlite. So note that in all of these examples, the uh, time span between the earlier uh, stages of the magmatism and uh, later stages of magmatism can be as long as 1 billion years. Well, now let's all um, get our trends on together on a single strontium niodymium plot. So we're looking at three different colors of rocks for these three trends and trends are shown with these three different colors. But most interesting for us is now the overprinting and superposition between our data and the literature data for Arkhangelsk kimberlites. So we see that for our lamprophies, we need four different geochemical reservoirs, depleted mantle, uh, enriched mantle, lower crust, and the old phenitized crust here. And we see that the uh, enriched mantle, metasomatized mantle, um, is one of prerequisite um, sources that mixed with other uh, reservoirs can produce lamprophy. So that Kimberlitic province mantle uh, is necessary in order to produce the cola lamprophies. And kimberlites are simpler than lamprophies because the only single sourced melt, local melt in places as the grip kimberlite. And all other kimberlites and all other lamprophies require multiple sources. And uh, now let's compare our lamprophies with kimberlites. And you see that the uh, reservoirs for them are absolutely ident identical. So Kepina kimberlite um, is produced from the same protolith as these lamprophies. Grebe kimberlite is produced from the same protolith as these lamprophies. Hermakovska kimberlite also, uh, the source of it is identical to the source of lamprophies. And this immediately poses a question of what makes one melt a lamprophia and another melt a kimberlite. And uh, we, of course, understand that uh, one of parameters that uh, plays into this identity of the rock on the, in the crust can be the degree of melting. But we also see some other factors, and I would like to illustrate these factors with our data. So the first is uh, Yermakovska 7 kimberlite. So you see that it's transitional by geography between lamprophies and kimberlites. And it's also transitional and intermediate between lamprophies and kimberlites geochemically. So geochemically, it has more titanium and potassium and high trace elements here. So the Yermakovskaya pipe is here showing uh, the spider diagram with quite high abundances of um, trace elements, much higher than the grip kimberlite, for example, and at par with ilikites, with ultramafic lamprophies in our Kola province and also at Eilig Bay. Also, by, with respect to oxygen fugacity, it is closer to lamprophia uh, that commonly cr would crystallize uh, magnetite and ilmenite. So uh, we can 
illustrate with this example a very local control on melt generation. And the second example is Mela kimberlite. So by the position on this diagram, we can immediately tell this is the most crustally contaminated kimberlite. But it is also this unusual kimberlite that emplaces in seals. And we uh, can speculate that perhaps these two things are related and maybe they could be explained by the slower ascent rate for this melt that allowed it to assimilate more lower crust and also devoid that melt of volatiles and made it um, in place non-explosively, less explosively than other kimberlites. So here we're coming again to conclusions. So we um, found lots of uh, relationships, links between the proximal kimberlite and alkaline province. And um, we also uh, see that lamprophies may have identical melt sources with kimberlites. And uh, we see lots of factors contributing to production to the identity of the melts in the crust, such as ascent rates, degrees of melting, geography. And finally, I hope that I convinced you that this odd trend of um, constant niodymium uh, ratios at highly radiogenic strontium ratio results from the uh, finitization and typical for large alkaline or Kimberlite province. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. That was really, really interesting. That was a great talk. Um, clearly, you were very busy on your sabbatical. Um, we can start with the question and answer period now. Um, if someone just wants to go ahead and ask one, you're more than welcome to. If not, I can pop open the chat and um, read it out as well. don't have anything coming up in the chat yet. Does anyone have anything that they'd like to ask? We should start the social hour earlier then. <laughs> <laughs> Herman says thank you, but he has to drop out early. <clears throat> Um, Jennifer has a question. So she's asking, why do the kimberlite sample diamonds and the lamp, um, lampers don't if they are the same melt? <clears throat> um, we can only speculate about it. And um, I think it comes to the different uh, volatile uh, abundances in lamprophies in and in kimberlites. And when we say that lamprophies and kimberlites are produced in the same geochemical reservoirs in the same protolith, we are not saying that they have initially the same compositions, yeah? Because different degrees of melting will be seen as different compositions of the initial melts. And these different compositions would, would, um, would also be seen as different amount of carbon dioxide and water. And that what explains the um, rate of ascent and also how the uh, melt uh, ascends in the 
uh, at deep horizons where they might have diamonds around. So how much explosive activity was there at depths of 250 kilometers? And if that melt is bringing a lot of uh, wall rocks together on the surface uh, with the melt. So that is explained by different amount of volatiles in my mind. And diamonds, of course, is just our normal wall rock at 250 kilometers. So if we have more explosive style of uh, the melt uh, emplacement at 250 kilometers, then we are just bringing more diamonds and more olivine. Does anyone um, else have I, anything? I have a question. Is Tom Nowitzki here? Mm -hmm. um, Maya, thanks for a great, very interesting talk. Um, I can't say I followed everything you were saying, <laughs> but um, it, it was very interesting nonetheless. And, and the, the question I have is, um, the, you're considering these, these lamprophies and kimberlites as being part of, a, of, of sort of the same province and being coeval or, 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 or so it's, uh, sort of close in time. Um, but actually, they're quite far away from each other. You know, they're several hundred kilometers away from each other in some cases. Um, and so there seems to be space to um, potentially have um, different different lithospheric thicknesses and things like that. Is there is there a difference in the depth of melting of these these uh, lamprophage related to the kimberlites? And is that a factor potentially in their petrology? Yeah, that's a uh, um, great. Uh, great question, and I would like to uh, actually um, see if I can share my screen again because I have um, I I have the uh, the map that illustrates this. So you see uh, the only uh, geophysical survey. Uh, done here in this part of uh, Russia and Finland is by Artemyeva. And you're uh, looking now on the left uh, on, on those several results of that survey, heat flow and lithosphere thickness. So um, where uh, if we locate ourselves, yeah. So we're looking at these areas, so Kola Peninsula is here and Kimberlite province is here. So uh, Moho temperature, the same. Then we're looking at the heat flow, also the same. And then we're looking at um, the thermal thickness. It's not uh, the highest at 275, but it's the second thickest. Uh, 225 kilometers, the thickness of the lithosphere here and here. So uh, yeah, we do not see any reasons um, for these two segments of the mantle be different, even though they are, yeah, indeed uh, 500,000 kilometers apart. I mean, those are very large scale studies and, and I'm wondering if there's, there's potential within that for sort of local, you know, relatively local variability on the scale of a few hundred kilometers. And do you have any xenoliths from the lamprophies that can help constrain? Unfortunately, the, the un, unfortunately not. Unfortunately okay. not. That would be much easier if we can yeah. look at lamprophy derived xenolith. But right. um, that's, that's why those odd locations of coeval kimberlites and lamprophies are so important because only kimberlites can bring us the mantle. And I agree with you that, uh, yeah, so that's a regional study uh, we're looking at and in the precision for these um, models is plus minus 50 kilometers, that's for sure. Thanks, Maya. Yeah. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to ask?
Okay. Well, if that's it, I will stop the recording here then. Oh, Jennifer mm -hmm. has another question. So Jennifer is asking, do you have any control on the depth of lamp for fear generation? Um, we um, almost don't. So we agree with the established view that they are generated uh, at a higher levels compared to Kimberlites, but we do not have any independent evidence of what uh, depth it is. So what we uh, normally see in lamprophies, um, antichrists, uh, the earlier crystallizing phenocrysts that are partly resorbed. And these would be analogs of megacrysts and kimberlites, if you wish, or analogs of xenocrystal cores in kimberlitic olivine. So this is potentially our way forward to estimate the initial depth of the lamprophy birth. So maybe we can uh, look for water in those antichrist olivine cores um, and estimate the depth of the origin for lamprophies. Um, it may be possible, but when we um, modeled crystallization of lamprophies, we did not model anything which is higher than um, let, let me remember exactly, 18 uh, kilobars. Yeah, so that would be uh, the crustal crystallization of those lamprophies. So we don't know where exactly in the mantle they were born. Okay. One last chance for questions before I turn off the recording. Okay, we'll stop recording here then. <laughs>